Um, I'm speaking this morning on the Holy Spirit. Uh, last Sunday night, we were asked to speak for the second time and do a healing service for a church that started this past year, uh, actually in the beginning of the year. Um, and it's a church in the Quad Cities, uh, Moline, East Moline, Rock Island, Davenport, uh, just for seniors. And uh, I, I shared that with Roger a while back, at, back in January. And, and I'm so excited about launching this tonight because it's a, it's a needy thing. I, Rockford really needs one. Uh, a lot of older people are really disenchanted with the church in America. We have several huge mega churches in my city. And uh, there's a lot of truth in the Bible you never hear anymore. I mean, never mentioned. It's a very one-sided gospel. And uh, praise the Lord for the full gospel. Amen? So God's about to do something. Are you ready? Let's pray. Would you ask the Lord to speak to you this morning? Lord Jesus, I lift up to you again, Pastor Roger. I thank you for my brother, my friend, this man of God. I ask you, Lord, to touch every cell in his body. Lord, curse the cancer and cause the cancerous cells to kill each other. Lord, rebuke every cancerous cell. Lord, heal his bowel in Jesus' name. We pray for Jennifer. Lord, I pray she'll live and not die and declare the glory of God. We, we believe your report, Lord. We thank you for doctors. We thank you for their expertise. We bless them. We thank you. You're the great physician. You're the healer of all mankind. And so we lift up these precious ones and any others that are in the body that are sick this morning. Lord, let your healing flow. You sent your word and you healed them. Lord, you don't need me. You don't need a man. Just speak your word and heal people today, Lord. Stir up faith in our hearts, God. Oh, Jesus, thank you. You sent the Holy Spirit. Father, you sent the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence. We ask you to reveal yourself to us today that we might glorify Jesus, that we might bring glory to the Father, that we might know you more intimately. Oh, Jesus, speak to our hearts. And release your gifts and power. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is a letter. Operation Mobilization. It's a worldwide mission organization. A friend of mine was in there for a while. She's a woman of God. Loves the Lord. Been walking with the Lord since I passed her as a college girl in, in the 1970s. She lives in Boston now. She sent me this letter from Operation Mobilization. I don't know if you remember years ago, back in the mid-80s, there was a, uh, a union carbide plant that we, I think, helped build and sponsor in, in India, both Paul, India, up in the north. And uh, it released poisonous gas. And everybody within a, a, a sh several block range was killed because the fumes went everywhere and just slayed tons of people. What you didn't hear on the news was this story. And this is from a very non-charismatic missionary organization called Operation Mobilization. And Anne is sending this uh, to me. It was a letter sent to her from her director, and then she just gave me the letter, the exact letter. This short report from Bhopal, India, who will, I'm sure, bless your heart. We have just received a report from India regarding the much-publicized disaster in Bhopal. An Indian brother who visited the area brought back news that the Christians there are very grateful for the prayers of God's people. It seems that no believer died in all those neighborhoods. Any born-again believer, nobody died. Somebody say holy coincidence or the living God. Amen? It says here, um, the greatest miracle was that many Christians living right near the Union card by plant were spared. When everyone else died. But listen to this. Children in a Christian orphanage slept through the night, very close to the, where the gas was the strongest, unharmed. One Christian home was surrounded by gas, but none inside were touched. Another family testified that their 15-year-old daughter had been badly affected, but as the mother cried out to the Lord, the daughter regained consciousness and was completely restored. Our God heals. Our God protects. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, this is from a Peruvian girl. I, I, 
I pastored Nigerians. I pa we had many nations and tribes. In our we had an international church for 27 years at a university. And so I've been a part of Nigerian dedications before, and this was nostalgic for me. But proving girl, Fabi, a uh, radical, wild, wealthy girl, parents very wealthy in Peru. Dad was a surgeon, lived high class. She got radically saved in our ministry. And uh, her whole family got saved after she did. And a little while later, her dad got diagnosed with cancer. And she got everybody praying. Am I not on? Okay. No problem. Thank you. Fix me. Yes. You fix me anytime you want. I love that brother. And that one. And Ken. And, well, all of you. Anyways, to make a long story short, he was prayed for, totally healed. Doctors couldn't explain it. He was a surgeon. Um, I've seen God healed rheumatoid arthritis, hiatal hernias, scarlet fever, rheumatic fever, um, sciatic nerves, double hernia surgery, um, multiple sclerosis, asthma, uh, STDs. STDs, sexual transmitted diseases. Uh, we had a girl from Cameroon in our ministry whose brother from Cameroon was told by the Lord he was not with the Lord. And she was a strong member of our body. And he was diagnosed with major AIDS. I mean, he was going down fast. And uh, he turned to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, fly to Kenya uh, and have this man of God pray for you. And so he did. And the man of God prayed for him. He was totally healed. He's in full-time ministry today. Hallelujah. I, mean, I, got, I, got, I got so many of these. I just, oh. Oh, here's a good one. You got to hear this one. This is from Zimbabwe, from a missionary named Danny Curl. Tremendous man of God. This outstanding testimony involves a lady who goes to my son Stephen's church. All four of his sons, he was from Canada. He raised all his sons in the bush of Zimbabwe. And uh, there is an amazing story. Burglars broke into uh, in a woman in his son Stephen's church in Zimbabwe. Uh, 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 people, burglars broke into one of the elderly parents' home in his church and were in the process of robbing them. One crook had her parents on their knees in the middle of the lounge at gunpoint while the other two searched the home. The daughter, unaware of what was happening, came walking in the front door. The surprised burglar shot her twice at close range. <coughs> And the impact of the bullets knocked her back all the way out the door of the lounge into the veranda, which is like a porch. She scrambled away to the neighbor's house, and they called police. As she began to calm down, the, no the neighbor noticed two holes in her jacket. They opened the jacket, and there were two holes in her blouse. They pulled up the blouse, and two bullets dropped onto the floor. There were no holes in her body. Point blank range. Can we say praise the Lord? Amen. I mean, I got I got I got stacks of these. This one here, I, I don't even like to share it publicly because nobody's going to believe it. But this is probably unethically the doctor report that this man had. I mean, I know you've had Tommy Alexander here, and he shares about miracles down in New Mexico that are just off the charts. This is one of those. This was a Hispanic lady in California that had a baby. Born with no brain. It's going to die immediately. And they called the pastor, who's a friend of mine, to come and pray for her. They put her in a room knowing, just waiting for her to die, and the parents being with her. This is a report of God putting a brain in her head, and she's totally all right today. You can't even get your head around what God's doing. This is a doctor report, gang. This isn't some pastor's made-up thing. This is a copy of the doctor. They have to write up a report on everything. We had a doctor, Indian doctor, uh, named Bose, who, who prayed for a, a, a boy that died in the emergency room. He had um, a nut allergy and um, bee sting allergy. And he was out playing one night. This was a few years ago in the summer, and somebody handed him an oatmeal cookie, and he didn't tell him it had nuts in it. He was only seven years old. He'd almost died like five years before when they found out he had these allergies. He went into a, a angiophactic reaction, whatever it's called, 
anaphylactic reaction, fell on the ground, swelled up, couldn't breathe. At that moment when he hit the ground, a bee stung him. Somebody had a cell phone, they called the emergency ambulance, they called the mother. She's in her 20s, late 20s, they take him to the emergency. And Dr. Bose is an administrative doctor. He hadn't done emergency medicine in 25 years. He's an administrator of a hospital. But he was filling in at his wife's hospital. Both his wife and him are doctors. They work in two different hospitals. He was filling in that summer night because they they were short on work, they had people on vacation. He, they just needed somebody to cover emergency that night. It's supposed to be a slow night. And he did everything he could, gave him all the medication he could, and the kid is passing. The mother is weeping. The monitor's starting to go straight line. There's one nurse there with him. And he says to the nurse, get the paddles. The last thing he said to the boy was, how do you feel? And he goes, not so good. And he passed. He passed. Nurse gets the paddles, comes over. That's common emergency procedure. And then doctor realizes he doesn't remember the dosage for a child that small. He only remembers what adults need. So he's got to read. He says, I don't have five or ten minutes to make sure I do this right for a child. He said, my whole life went before my eyes. He said, all I could see was a malpractice suit. I'll lose my license. It's over. But he's a spirit-filled, born-again Christian from the largest church, one of the largest churches in India, Dr. Reverend Mahan in New Delhi. And he said to the mother, is it okay if I pray for him? <laughs> She's wailing. He prayed a prayer that he told us that was on Friday night. We saw him on Monday, and uh, Monday morning. He to repeated the prayer, and I think he repeated it the way he said it. Because if I had, if I could have recorded any prayer, I would have wish I recorded that one. And all of a sudden, the monitor started, heart started beating. But what was really amazing was he already given him a ton of medication. Within minutes, the boy had a completely clear head. He didn't have any effects from the drugs. He wanted something to eat, he wanted something to drink, he wanted to color, he wanted to play. And uh, the mother now is jumping up and down screaming, crying, thanking him. Doctor wrote me a copy of that report that I have in my file today. Because you have to fill out a file. I said, what did you write? What did you write? The kid died, you prayed, he came back to life. It wasn't medicine. What did you write in the report? He said, I'm gonna, he got a piece of paper, said, here's the report, here's what I wrote. That gave him these medications, I couldn't pronounce them. And he, and he said, uh, and then he said, healed by divine intervention. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah! He's the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Did you happen to find the outline, Brittany, or no, couldn't get it? Okay. Um, uh, so I want to I talk to you about the Holy Spirit and the baptism. And, and I want to just start with this. Go to Acts 2. We're going to do this a little different. I haven't done it this way in here before. Acts chapter 2. The disciples are following Jesus now for some time. He's died. He's rose from the dead. He's with them for 40 days. And he tells them, wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. That's in the end of Luke, chapter uh, 24. And so they went in the upper room and they sought the Lord for what is considered his by historians about 10 days. Fasting and praying for 10 days, not knowing what they're waiting for, except it's supposed to be power. It's supposed to be the Holy Spirit. But they don't have any reference point for this. Okay? And he, here's where we are in chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly, by the way, we're living in the day of suddenly. I did a prophetic message here about five or six years ago that we're in a time of constant change, and I, I said that six years ago, but it's more now than it was then. It was more then than it was ten years before that. We are in radical change. That radical changing of society, of culture, uh, 
the news cycles are even boggling newscasters. Usually a story will last for a few days or a few weeks. It's boom, 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 boom. They can't, it's just, I mean, even motion pictures, they come to the theater, they're gone in 10 days and they're gone. When I was a kid, a great movie was held over in the newspaper, held over for 26 weeks, you know. <laughs> boom, boom, things are moving fast, accelerating. It's a time of change. It's a time of suddenlies. You just don't know what's going to happen next. One thing exciting about the last days that I enjoy, because it's changing so rapidly and it's all suddenlies, there's no boring, boredom anymore in my life. <laughs> if you love the news like I do, there's nothing boring. I mean, you gotta admit, things are not boring. Now, those who don't have Jesus and don't realize his sovereignty rules over all and he's got everything, everybody say he's got everything yeah. under control. If you don't have that revelation, then 75, 85% of all Americans are struggling with huge levels of stress or depression or both. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus is the peacemaker. Jesus is our peace. He wants to take all stress and heal all depression. There's no doubt in my mind about that. There's lots of verses on that. That's another message. But they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent wind. I think the Great Awakening is going to be a suddenly. I believe God is going to pour out his spirit on all flesh soon enough because he promised he would. And it's going to happen. Because everything else he said that was going to happen, that should have happened by now, has happened. In the fullness of time, God gave his only begotten son. He had prepared the world for thousands of years, and then one night in Bethlehem, he slipped inside the body of the Virgin Mary. Hey, Amen. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were seated. Wouldn't it be awesome? You ever read about revival? I, I, got, I, I, I was a baby Christian. When I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I got saved my sophomore year, but I got filled with the Holy Ghost the very tail end last month of my senior year. When I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, everything changed. When I got saved, the only thing that changed was my heart. I changed on the inside. I really did change. Outwardly, nothing else changed. Nobody would have believed I was a Christian. So I didn't even bother telling anybody because they would have laughed or, 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 or swore at me or whatever because I was a mess. I had the worst personality, the worst character. I had the, the addictions. I mean, I was a mess. But Jesus came in and knew what I knew. He was real. First thing I knew when Jesus came in my heart is he's not like the motion pictures of Jesus you see at the theaters, <laughs> which back in those days, they weren't even modern. I mean, it was like the old kind of Jesus, you know, with the long robe and the, my son. He was real stoic, you know. The first thing when I met Jesus was like, oh, he's neater than Clint Eastwood. <laughs> he's not a wimp. He's not a wimp. Wow. I got revelation after revelation. But it was three years before my personality and character re really began to change. And that was because, number one, I wasn't in the Word. This is most important. This is the sure foundation. Number two, not only was I not in the Word daily, I wasn't filled with the Spirit. When those two things happened, everything changed. You looking for a change in your life? Let me ask you a question. Do you read the Bible every day? Do you read it every day because you have to, you should, it's a ritual, a religious ritual, or do you read it because you really believe it's the word of Almighty God, it releases faith and power, and it will transform your life. It's a living word or it's a dead religious book, depending on your faith and your attitude of your heart. But I guarantee if you read it every day by faith, with a heart humble toward God and toward his word, it'll change your life. Now you add the baptism of the Holy Spirit on there. See, what happens when you start reading the Word every day is you start putting real good, dry, kindling wood on a, on a fireplace. Then when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, God just takes the torch. Anybody ever? I, I, when we lived at the cabin, when we first started coming here back in uh, 2013, 14, 
and uh, we lived down north of Freeport, out in the woods, out in the country, and and uh, I got I, I used to prune trees, so I pruned all these big trees. I had I had a mega big I had a pile of branches higher than this ceiling, and it was probably is at least from here to these guys, and uh, it was huge. And I thought, man, you know, some of this is still green, but I want to burn this down. So I got a gallon. I got a gallon of gasoline, you know. I had never really lit a bonfire before myself, so I sp I threw it on there everywhere, you know. And I thought to myself, you know, I know that this can be explosive. I probably should stand back a little ways. So I had a wooden, you know, match, you know. And I, I thought, well, maybe I should just. And I, 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 I went back far enough that I didn't get hurt. I didn't go back far enough that I didn't feel the singe on my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I flicked that back. <laughs> I mean, I literally fell back and I was like, whoa, whoa, I, I could have killed myself there. You know. The Holy Ghost is better than that. And he's safer. Right? Only people that don't have him are afraid of him. But once you have him, once you've tasted, you're wasted. In a good way. And it says, there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Every one of them received it. Every one of them received the gifts. Because it's God's will for every born-again believer to be released in the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, you are not lacking in any gift waiting the return of Christ. See, we th have this misconception of the gifts. We think it's like a card deck dealer. Choo, choo, choo. Teaching, wor wor uh, worship, uh, evangelism, uh, prophecy, healing. I wonder which one of the gifts I have. And there actually are books that teach like this. And I got rid of all of them in my library because it's not the way it works scripturally. The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may not be of us, but of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Now, the gifts that are distributed like that are the motivational gifts. So there's three lists of gifts in the Bible. There's, and actually, there's a fourth one that's a combination of the three. In Romans 12, 4 to 7 are the motivational gifts. There are seven of those that have to do with your personality type. Those, actually, you can start spotting in someone when they're a child, like a toddler. You can start seeing what kind of motivational gift they have. If you know the teaching, you know the seven gifts, you know the strengths and weaknesses, you can get these handouts. They're wonderful. And you, we knew our daughter, what she was by the time she was two years old. That's how clear once you know what the teaching is. Those are the motivational gifts. Those are what motivate you in life. There's, that's your core uh, that, I call them the personality gifts, okay? And then you have the apostolic gifts in Ephesians 4, 4 to 8. And those are apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor. And there's five of those. And those are ministry office gifts that you rise up into. Now, even if you're not in the office of one of those gifts, you'll tend to have a tendency to minister in the vein of one of those five. So there's people here that just naturally love evangelism. There's people who just naturally love to teach and do, do teaching. There's some here that like to just be pastoral, like to pray for people, like to listen, like to nurture, like to counsel. You see what I'm saying? And then there's the nine supernatural gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Those are also found in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 11. There's three speaking gifts, uh, three uh, knowledge gifts, and three power gifts. The speaking gifts are tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. The knowledge gifts are wor word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discernment of spirits. And the power gifts are special gifts of faith, gifts of miracles, and uh, special gifts of faith, miracles, and what's the other one? Healing. Various kinds of healings. Amen? Now, those gifts are the ones that are available to anybody that wants to be a vessel. And the Holy Spirit will choose and give you them as he wills. And so go to, uh, hold, hold your finger in Acts 2. Go to 1 Corinthians 12, 11 real fast. Help you understand this. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 12, right after he lists the gifts of the Spirit in 8 to 11. By the way, the distinguishing mark, 
And this is found in 2 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. It says, test yourselves. I'm quoting now verbatim. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. That is that Christ is in you. That's what it says there in those verses. If you're a born-again Christian, Christ lives in you. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Now, if he's in you, he brought all the gifts with him. Our job as Christians is to not try to get to the gifts. It's to yield to the giver. What I'm here to do is challenge you to believe more. God isn't asking you to do more. He's asking you to believe more. And believing is an active thing, not a passive thing. Well, if he wants me to have it, I'm open to it. No, you're not going to get it. Because the way of believing and, do, and acting on it is asking. Asking fervently, diligently. Asking with faith. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking, the door will be open. Keep on asking and you'll, you'll receive. All who ask, receive. All who seek, find. All who knock, the door is open. Those are two promises in Matthew 7, 7, and 8. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, it says, He lists the gifts of Spirit. Look at verse 7. But to each one, that's every believer, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The manifestation of the Spirit are the nine gifts he's going to list next. These are the manifestation gifts. The first gifts are the motivational gifts. The ministry office gifts are the ministry office gifts. These are the manifestation gifts. These are miraculous, supernatural gifts. Everybody has them. And notice it says the manifestation is singular. Some people think it's just tongues. No, it's the Holy Spirit manifesting the gifts. There's one singular spirit who manifests himself. Because the gifts of the spirit, folks, are not a quantity of something. Like, here's some money. No. <laughs> just an illustration. <laughs> we think the gifts operate like that. No, 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 no. The gifts are the Holy Spirit. If you get a word of knowledge and you know something supernatural about somebody you, don't even, you couldn't have known, that's the Holy Spirit who's all-knowing, knowing what that is, and tells you, and then you repeat what the Holy Spirit already knows. If you have a gift of healing, it's not that God put medicine through your hands and it touches a person. It's that God, who is God, the Holy Spirit, knows that human body, knows what's wrong, knows the cause, and knows the cure, and he just flows through you and touches their body. All the manifestations are the manifestations or the outward demonstration, outward demonstrative showing of the Holy Spirit himself manifesting himself. So if you have the Holy Spirit, and he's got all of them, Guess what? You're not lacking in any gift awaiting the return of Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Ephesians 1, 3, every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3, 20 to 22, everything Christ has, you have. <laughs> Romans 8, 17, 15, 17, we are co-heirs with Christ, everything he has, we have. If we understand we're vessels, the moment you think it's you, you're going down. The gifts are going to dry up. Pride has entered in. God's going to have to resist that. But the moment we always know it's him and not us, and he gets all the glory, all the credit, all the honor, all the praise, all the time, then it's safe for him to use us. Amen? So it says in verse 11, after he lists the gifts, he lists them 8, 9, and 10, he lists those nine gifts I just told you about. Now, he ends the gifts by saying this, but one and the same Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, works all these things. Everybody say all. All, all means, referring back to 8 to 10, those nine supernatural gifts. Amen? Amen? But the one and same Spirit works all these things, distributing. Well, I thought you said it wasn't like that. He isn't like that, like a card deck dealer. But he's distributing. Let me explain. But one of the same spirit works all those things, distributing to each one individually, just as he, the Holy Spirit, wills to do. Wills. Now, here's the misunderstanding that even a lot of Christian books on this, miss, the author doesn't get it. 
A lot of people don't get this. He distributes from where? From where? Not, 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 not himself. Location. He distributes from where? Where? Within. He's inside you. He's not down in heaven dropping them down on you. He's distributing from within you because he has them all. And so he could use you in the gift of healing, and next week you could come to prayer meeting, and he doesn't use you, and he uses Joan. And the next week he doesn't use Joan, he uses Bob, and so forth. And because he wants the body to flow together. He want, this, the, the, God is really in the community and unity and the body. He loves the body. He loves the body working together. We are co-laborers with Christ. Oh, that's another whole sermon for another day. But when you understand that, just know this about the Lord's Prayer. Did I tell you this? I've never taught that yet. That's one of the greatest revelations God has ever given me in my life. There's twice in my life I've been studying for a sermon, and God would download a revelation to me that wasn't about the sermon. It was about something else. And I literally dropped my Bible on the floor and started shaking, alone in my study, because I was so overwhelmed by the depth of the revelation. One was when I was studying the Hebrew names of God, and the other one even greater when I was studying the Lord's Prayer. And he downloaded the greatest revelation I've ever got in my life that to this day I, I long to get back to that experience because it was an unlimited experience. I was studying for a sermon. I was looking at a commentary to see what it said about a particular verse just to see different sh shadings of interpretation and meaning. And in the, just as a side note, the author of that particular commentary, and this commentary was full of many authors. So it was a commentary of a compilation. And this one guy that was being quoted made reference about the topic I was studying, but then he put this in as a, a side note, uh, referring to the Lord's Prayer, which I wasn't studying, as the perfect prayer. And I went, what's that mean? It said the ancients believed the Lord's Prayer was the perfect prayer. So I, I didn't have time to study that. I finished my sermon. I preached that. Next week, I thought, i got to research. I started researching everything I could find on why the ancients called it the perfect prayer. Why do they call it the perfect prayer? And I found out why. I mean, we're talking ancient, ancient times, back in the first hundred years of Christianity. Because when the disciples said to Jesus, teach us how to pray, he said, say this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now most of us, especially if we're over 40, and we're raised in traditional churches, we can say the Lord's Prayer without even thinking. You could do anything you want to do activity-wise, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But, uh, <laughs> Because we have it down. If you're Lutheran or Catholic, you know this thing. <laughs> Backwards and forwards. Right? You don't even have to be awake. I follow right now and how it be right here. Like I believe Satan has made that and get us to make that a ritual, a routine. Because that's the perfect prayer. Because when Je disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, he gave this prayer. And it came from what? The most perfect lips of the most perfect tongue, of the most perfect person, who came from the most perfect place and lived the most perfect life to teach sinners how to live the most perfect life they could in this life, in spite of sin and the, and the downfall of the earth. And God just opened up revelation to me. I'll just give you one. By the way, I thought I'd do a sermon on it. I could only do a sermon on one phrase at a time. I did 12 weeks, each phrase because there was so much revelation. And when I finished, it's the saddest I've ever been finishing a series because I wanted to stay. I, I felt like God opened up, like I had an experience, like God opened up this window and I looked at it and it was like, it was like an infinite level of revelation. Let me just say this about that. I believe hidden within the Lord's Prayer is an infinite amount of revelation on each phrase to give you literally, as you receive revelation on that stuff, the greatest way you could possibly live, the most victorious Christ-like life in this life ever, even though we're fallen people. That's what's 
God can do a lot in a little bit. Let me give you one insight. Now, I said, I'll say this. We're talking about the body. Every pronoun in the Lord's Prayer is plural. Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Deliver us from every pronoun. There's not a singular pronoun in it. This, now, let's just take one of those. Because, like I said, there's just layers of revelation in this. Give us this day our daily bread. We all pray something about that every day, even if we don't say those words. God, we've got to have money for bills. Oh, God, it's really tight. Right? Lord, the car is going out. We've got to get a new car. Man, we don't got much time left. This thing is, oh, Lord, my daughter's sick, and we need money for medicine. <laughs> on and on and on. We tend to pray about our deepest emotional needs individually for the individual. Give us this day our daily bread. You know what God's will is? Is that we so understand the mentality of the body that whatever I pray for, I pray for others at the same time. God, give me enough bread to meet all my needs and share some with others who are in need. Lord, heal me, not for my sake, but heal me so well that I could be a vessel of healing to others. You may get a witness on that. Did you get a witness on that? Isn't that like sound like Jesus? Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit's distributing the gifts from within you. And our job is to yield and believe. Believe and yield. Ask, yield, and believe. Amen? So I encourage you. In Acts chapter 2, I wrote this, the power of, and prayer, verse 14, 24. Prayer, by the way, is in almost every single chapter of the uh, book of Acts. In chapter 2, we see the explosive revealing of the supernatural. In this chapter 2, we just read, back to Acts, we see the explosive nature, supernatural revelation of God. <clears throat> right at the start. In the first four verses, the chapter speaks of a sudden supernatural sound, verse 2. A supernatural sight, verse 3. And a supernatural speaking or utterance, verse 4. These supernatural manifestations also reveal a prophetic revealing of a personal application to our lives. What are these applications? Verse 2, the sound of the mighty rushing wind. What does that represent? What did it mean for them? What did they experience? They experienced the presence of God coming into that room. Now, you could take this, believe it or not. My wife and I were given a free trip to Israel in about 1984. And it was really a wild story how we were given it to it because we didn't find out until half a year later why this rich couple who wanted to be, wanted to be anonymous gave us this gift. It's a really interesting, interesting story. But anyway, so we're on this tour group, about 50-some people, including my pastor, Moan, who went fairly regularly and took groups, but we could never afford it. But we, we had all expense paid, plus spending money, plus we had a stopover in Vienna, Austria, $100 tickets to the opera, and, uh, oh, and then three days in a Holiday Inn right next to the pyramids in Egypt, in Cairo, Egypt. It was just... We've been blessed. But when we're in the upper room in Jerusalem, it looks the same as it did 2,000 years ago. That's the most amazing thing about Israel. If any of you have not been to Israel, it looks like it did 2,000 years ago. They have not developed. There's modern cities like Tel Aviv, but in Jerusalem, everything still looks pretty much like it looked back then. Uh, it it kind of takes your breath away. When you travel outside the city of Jerusalem, it's definitely primitive. I mean primitive. You're still, if you drive from... Jerusalem down to Jericho uh, on what's called the Old King's Highway, which is just a two-lane road, you will see Bedouin shepherds with their sheep uh, going across the horizon. And, and uh, our guide actually knew one of them, and he was a Coptic Egyptian Christian, our guide was, and he stopped the bus one time and said, I know him, let me see if I can get him to let us meet him. So he walked about a block into the desert, came back and said, he said, okay, come on. And so we got, the, we got pictures. My wife actually put on one of the ladies' dresses over her clothes. And, and uh, they cook on a dung fire. They carry their water and leather pouches, animal pouches. In fact, they live exactly what Abraham did 4,000 years ago. 
So you get a lot of insight, right? So when we went into the upper room, it looked probably exactly how it looked 2,000 years ago. They haven't touched it. It's old brick. It's dusty. There's windows open to the outside. Obviously, it's mostly warm there. We came up the steps. We got into this big open room, and we're in the upper room. I have a picture of this in my library. And Pastor Nolan says, we, we got to pray. Let's just pray. And somebody let out in a chorus, and we began to worship God. And as we worship God, and by the way, this was a really hot, dry, still day. All of a sudden, while we're worshiping God, I can't say it was a mighty rushing, but a definite breeze started stirring around the room. And everybody went, ah! everybody gasped. And we just kept singing. Pretty soon we're all crying because the presence of the Lord is so strong. And this breeze is going around the room, and we know there's no fans in the room. There's no air conditioning, but it was incredible. What was really the, the, the topper on that was when we finished up praying, we had our eyes closed, we weren't paying attention. A Jewish tour group were waiting on the steps to come up there next. By the way, right under the upper room in David's citadel is the coffin of King David. It's the most holy site to the Jews. I mean, they have people like every six feet and you, you better not, if you make one thing, movement out of line, they get you out. You've got to wear a hanukkah, you've got to be quiet, there's no talking. And uh, I mean, it's real, real, real reverent. And so this Jewish group were coming up, and they stopped on the stairs when they heard us singing. When we finished, they motioned some from our group to come over to them. So they went over there, and they said, We've never heard singing like that. Oh, we were singing in tongues, too. We said, we've never, we've never heard singing like that. And what's that presence we feel? Isn't God awesome? Yes. He's the same. <laughs> and let me say he's the same. The same. Hallelujah. So the applications of the rushing wind is his presence comes. The, the cloven flames of fire represent his purification. I'm telling you, I was a carnal Christian even though I loved Jesus before I got baptized Spirit. But once I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, stayed in the Word daily, and used my tongues daily, He started cleaning up the carnality of my life. I didn't say I cleaned it up. I didn't say I got my act together. He cleaned me up. He purified me. He took addictions. He broke pornography. He, He, He did it. I didn't do it. And I wanted it done before that because I was sold out to God before I got baptized in the Spirit. And I couldn't conquer so many things I could name. He conquered it. The Bible talks about the Spirit will crucify your flesh. You can't crucify your flesh because you can only pound one nail in. Unless you've got a really good foot and then you can count that one in. Then you can't get both feet. You can't crucify yourself. You need Him to do it. And you can do it by religion, which will kill you. Or you can do it by the Holy Spirit will give you life. And He'll do it. He'll take your wrong desires out. He'll put new desires in. When you don't want to do this and this and this anymore. I remember when he took alcohol away. I was like, ugh. Can't stand the smell. I, I, like, I like when God takes smoking away from people. My mom and dad both smoked all my life, man. Five o'clock in the morning. Dad got up for work. Smoke filled the house. I hated cigarette smoke. But I've had people get saved, and, and we know we have delivered from that. When you can't stand the smell anymore, you used to smoke. Amen? That's what the Holy Ghost can do. Your flesh can't do that, but the Holy Ghost can. Amen? So the, the flames of fire are for purification and they're for enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm came from the first century Christians. It means in God in Greek. Enthuse, in God. These people had a joy and a power that nobody had ever seen before. Yeah, I got to go. No, you're okay. No, I'll, uh, I'll wrap this Parents, up. Parents, uh, please go pick up your kids from their classrooms yes. at this time, and Dale's going to continue. If you have to leave, you can leave, but we're going to give Dale a little bit more time. I'm, I'm just going to wrap this up, and then I'm going to give an altar call for the baptism. So the, the, the flames of fire are not only for purifying, they're going to set you on fire. They're going to set you on fire. Hallelujah. Amen? I was thinking about this last night. Roger and I had a discussion about something. It had to do with control. Control is a work of the Holy Spirit. He gives you the fruit of self-control. Think about that. The Holy Spirit gives you the fruit 
of self-control. Apart from the Holy Spirit, you can't get self-control. Oh, you can get real discipline. There are people that are really highly disciplined. But you know what happens to people that are really highly disciplined without the Holy Spirit so they control self themselves? They're, hard, they're almost impregnable for the Holy Spirit to get to. Because they're so self-willed, which, is, by the way, is the sin of iniquity, he can't even break in any way. You don't want to be strong-willed, self-willed. You want to be humbly, submissive will to the Holy Spirit. And then he gives you his strong will. It's the Holy Spirit through you with self-control. Amen? And so he gives you, but the Holy Spirit wants to possess you. The idea of the Holy Spirit filling us is being spirit-controlled. See, there's three big hindrances for Christians receiving the power in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Fear, giving up control, being childlike. All of those cause us to be crucified. I don't want to be childlike. I'm reasonable. I'm analytical. This doesn't make sense. I'm going to speak in a language I didn't learn. It's going to sound like gibberish. See, I need to be humble like a child. I also need to have a clear conscience because if I have a bad conscience, I can't receive. I need a clear conscience. Why? Because a clear conscience is what makes a strong faith. And if you have a weak conscience, a, a defiled conscience, you have a weak faith. Timothy says that. So then, the, and then the last one, the tongues is for what? Speaking in tongues is for power. Everybody say power. power. I don't know about you, but I need more power in my Christian life. I need more power to live in this day. I need more power in my faith. I need more power in my praying. I need more power in my testifying. I need more power in my preaching. I need more power in, in my relationships. Speaking in tongues releases power. It releases power in every area you pray in tongues about. So whatever you think about and you pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit's energizing that area. That's what it means. When it talks about him empowering, it means in the Greek he energizes you. He gives you supernatural ability and, and strength and power. And so tongues is for what? It's to edify. It builds you up in the Spirit, in God. It, give, it brings you into intimacy. Believe it or not, speaking in tongues brings you into greater intimacy with Jesus. Now, if you use it regularly and you stay in the Word, you will experience greater and greater intimacy with Jesus. You want that. Because when you have intimacy with Jesus, your emotional needs are going to be comforted and met better than your spouse. The more your needs are met by Jesus, the less you look to your spouse and children to meet your needs to give you recognition, to give you respect, to give you this, to give you affection. See, everybody, all humans are looking for these things from other humans, and we constantly get frustrated or angry. But if you get all your needs met from Jesus, emotionally, then you're free to just give. And when people don't give back, you're able to rise above it and go, they must be hurting. I need to pray for them. i never forget my daughter. She was so secure as a little girl. We walked through a Bergner's... Uh, department store at the mall in Carbondale. She was just a little girl, probably under three years old, two, three, four years old, something like that, really young. And we're walking through the cosmetic department to get out the store because I parked on that end of the store parking lot. And we're walking through there, and there was an elderly, very sophisticated, very well-dressed lady, a little older, probably, I was probably in my 30s. She would have probably, no, I was in my 40s. She was probably in her 60s. She was very well-dressed, very sophisticated, and she was looking at the counter. The girl was waiting on her. And as we walked by, Michelle was, hey, Michelle was real goofy, you know, and she's just, and uh, so the, girl, the lady looked at her, and Michelle goes, hi. <laughs> and she's a real extrovert, hi. <laughs> and the lady just glared at her, <laughs> like, you know, stupid little kid. And I was like, do I kill her now or later? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I thought of her when she was dancing around during worship. What's her name? Lillian, I'm telling you, she might be like, I was like, oh, Leah, she's just dancing around while we're worshiping the Lord. I just thought that was so good. Anyways, um, so I was really upset. So I look at Michelle's face to see if she's wounded. And she's like, and I said, after we got to the end of the store, out, going out the door, I said, did that hurt you? That lady gave you a dirty look and just kind of grunted at you? She goes, no. I go, how come? 
<laughs> because I put myself in her shoes and I would have been rejected for the rest of the day. And she goes, I don't know. She must have a problem. <laughs> I go, that's right. She does. <laughs> that's wholeness, gang. Amen. The people don't get under your skin, but you can help get under theirs and help them get out from underneath theirs, whatever. <laughs> By the way, tongues is not only for intimacy and edification, it's for prayer. Nothing will energize your prayer life like speaking in tongues. Number two is for praise. Nothing will energize your worship like, like praying in tongues. Number three, proclamation. It anoints you with unction to share the truth. When you're anointed, people want to listen to you. People will be receptive. The Holy Spirit will rest them. And it's for prophesying. And you can call those things that are not as though they were. God wants to teach. That's another scene for another day on prophecy. So the Holy Spirit's with you. When you're not saved, he's convicting you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When, he's, when you get saved, he comes in you. But in the Baptist Holy Spirit, he comes upon you, and he envelops you, and he possesses you, and he clothes you with power from on high. If you're here today and you don't have that, it is for believers. Jesus told disciples, don't leave home without it. He didn't say get a credit card. He said, don't leave home without this. Amen? And so you need this. By the way, it'll make the word alive. Oh, it makes the word alive. It makes prayer easy. It makes worship intimate. Amen? And it'll conquer you. The Holy Spirit can conquer you where you can't. So I'm going to go to the back room, and we're going to close right now. They're going to set up for tonight. In the back room, not the pool room, but the back Sunday school room, all the way to the back, on the right, go all the way as far as you can go down that hallway. If you'd like prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, maybe you once had it and you quit using it altogether and you don't know if you can do it again, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get our Holy Ghost Jeopardy cables and restart that battery. Amen? If you've never received, come and receive, because I can tell you when the Holy Spirit came inside you, he brought a prayer language of tongues just for you. And it will release power in your life. And you will never regret it. Once you get it, you'll only regret that you waited so long. So don't let the devil scare you. Isn't it amazing how people get into Halloween and demonic stuff, and they're not afraid. They think it's cool. They think it's cute. And yet they're afraid to death to get closer to God. You know what? It should be the opposite. We should want to stay away from the demonic as much as Paul, you know, and just not delve into that area. And we should just go after everything God has for us. We'll also pray for the sick uh, to the Nigerian couple. Uh, you, be, you, guys, you, you guys tell your parents what I'm going to tell you, okay? Tell them what I'm going to tell you now. This oil I anointed with is the holy oil from the Bible in Dalton, Georgia. There's a Bible in Dalton, Georgia that started exuding oil supernaturally out of it January 27, 2017. Over two and a half years, over five barrels of oil, five to, gal five to eight gallons a week have been coming out of the Bible. You can Google this. Look at the healing oil of his presence coming from Bible in Dalton, Georgia. And this is the oil. And I'm telling you, you cannot believe the miracles I have personally seen. They have seen. This has now gone into 200 countries. It is phenomenal. And God, they said, what do we call this? We don't want it to be an idol. Seven months they prayed when it first happened before they told anybody. But Jerry, this old retired guy, when he went to have a quiet time one morning, oil was all over Psalm 39, and it was going into other pages. And then the next day it went further, and then they had to put it in a Ziploc bag, then they had to put it in a Tupperware container. Now they have it in a farm and fleet container about this high that's clear and about this square, and it fills up every two days. And while I was there, I went down, my wife and I stopped there on the way back from Florida with her folks. We just stopped for 15 minutes to see it. It had just been revealed that it happened because they didn't let it out till August of 18, and that's when we were traveling through. And we stayed for four and a half hours as those people just shared with us miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Gang, God is up to radical stuff. Amen? And he can do something in Glarus, Wisconsin. It's never happened before or anywhere else in the world. He's just looking for people to believe. Would you bow your heads? Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll deal with our unbelief. Lord, search out our unbelief. Lord, unbelief is a sin, and we don't want to sin against you by rejecting your character and your promises and your gifts and graces. 
Lord, I thank you that if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, is there anyone here quickly this morning, you're not right with Jesus? You don't know if Jesus is living inside you. You might have been religious, you might have once received him, you've fallen away. You need to get right with God. And God wants you back more than you could imagine. In fact, he sent me here just to do this. If you're here today and you want to make sure your heart is right with Christ, all your sins are forgiven and he lives inside you, would you just put your hand up in the air and put it down and say, Pastor, pray for me. Is there anyone here? Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Just lift your hand up and put it down if you're not right with God. You want to get right with God. Anybody else? Yes, God bless you. Yeah, bless you. God bless Okay. About four or so. Let's just pray right now. Everybody follow me that will. And let's really just talk to Jesus because he is alive and he is coming again. Follow me out loud, please. Dear Jesus, I confess I am a sinner. And I have lived more supremely for myself than I have for you. And I repent for breaking your heart. I repent for living for myself as boss more than you as Lord and boss. I believe you can run my life better than I can. And I repent for all my sins. I thank you you died for every one of them. I thank you that nothing's impossible for you, that you've already forgiven them, and you have the power to change me. I receive you, Jesus. I can't earn or deserve your forgiveness, but I receive all your forgiveness. I receive you into my heart, into my life, and I ask you to give me a desire to read your word, your perfect love casting out fear, and filling me with your spirit, and cause me to bring you glory. I want to know you. I receive all you have planned for my life. And I thank you for dying for me, rising from the dead, and wanting to have a relationship to me. And thank you that you'll never leave me or forsake me. I love you, Jesus. I trust you. I receive you. In Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you to seal every commitment that was just made. I ask you to make yourself real. I ask you, Lord, to give them wisdom to deal with whatever's holding them back, whatever makes them struggle, whatever hinders their faith. I ask you to root out unbelief and any other things that defile their conscience. And I ask you, Lord, to give them faith to believe for your victory. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to get them in your word daily and cause their faith to grow. I thank you faith comes from your word. Now cleanse their conscience with your precious blood and make them white as snow. Let, thank you that you have already. Thank you that it's finished because you said so. And so cause them to receive it and walk in it for your glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen.